welcome once again to our online service and special welcome to the people who have joined in for the first time and I hope you feel right at home. We're so glad that you joined in today. Let me encourage you with a scripture before we get into worship. It's from Psalm 100 and verse 4. It says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Amen. Come on, why don't we take a moment today to think of one thing that God has done in the past week that we are thankful for. I'm thankful that God added one more year in my life. What are you thankful for today? With that thought, I have one exciting thing to share with you that we have the privilege of having rich music and Sam Alex and his team lead us into worship today. Let's get straight into it and bless the name of the Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. No matter where we are, we can stop worshiping you, God, because you worthy, you worthy, you worthy. Oh, you welcome, you welcome right now, God. Yes, God, we invite you right now into our midst no matter where we are no matter who we are no matter what we do no matter what's happening around us you are still sovereign and we we are here to worship you holy spirit come be enthroned on our praises right now
So sing a little louder. Sing it out. Sing a little louder. 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 Let's sing a little louder. I'll sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. than the power of the grave constant through the trial and the change one thing remains just one
Your name cannot be overcome, no matter what. Your name is alive, that the shadows can deny. Your name cannot be overcome. It won't be God, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus. Oh, you silence me, every fear, God. Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus.
Let us draw our hearts to the communion table as we celebrate the name of Jesus. The book of Philippians chapter 2, Paul tells us that even though Jesus, even though he was God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. Amen. As we celebrate communion, we realize that Jesus gave of himself. He let his body be broken on the cross for you and for me. He carried our sickness and our infirmity and by his stripes we are healed. As we partake, let's determine in our hearts that we also will give our lives entirely to serve God make ourselves nothing and consider only the will of the one who has sent us, who has saved us and who has called us. Let us partake together. And after supper, he took the cup and he sealed this covenant by shedding his blood, giving it to us entirely so that we might be forgiven, so that we might have his righteousness, so that the covenant that he came to establish now once and for all is sealed through the precious blood of Jesus. Let us partake of this cup in remembrance of him. Amen. Father, I thank you and I pray for each one who partakes in this table that you strengthen them through these elements that we may live a life for you live a life like Jesus did totally committed to you Heavenly Father that you may be Lord, that you may be Master, that you may be King and that we may know today that the covenant you established with us is totally secure and entirely paid for through your death on the cross and through your precious blood. Bless each one as we continue to worship together in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning church and welcome again to New Life and thanks for joining us this morning. What an amazing morning we've been having. So thankful to Bridge Music and Sam Alex for leading us in worship and uh, it's such a great privilege for me to be ministering the word of God this morning and I thank Pastor Victor for this opportunity. If you were here with us last Sunday, we didn't stream our service but we were on a Zoom call. It was a family gathering, a private meeting where Pastor shared from his heart and I'm sure you remember about the new paradigm of the church. And today God has put a word on my heart that I believe is related to this. We've been discussing this message in our life groups about how church has changed in our giving, in our worship, in our ministry, in our fellowship on Zoom and online. So I believe that God has really stirred up something in my heart that will be an encouragement for you. God has put on my heart that He is calling our church to be a generous church. Come on, can you say amen to that? If you're living in this world with me right now in the year 2020, can you believe nine months have already gone by? The world is becoming a difficult place. It is challenging everywhere. And we hear of uh, economies struggling with their growth rate in negative. Even our country, we need to pray for our economy constantly. Uh, com companies are not able to give bonuses. People are being laid off. People are being cheated because there's so much of loss of finances and people are struggling all around. But in this time, I believe that God has put a mantle on the church 
if we are called to be the light of the world, if we are called to be the salt, in these last days, I believe one of the hallmarks of the church will be that God is saying we are a generous people, we are a generous church. Amen? So this is not just generosity with our money, this is uh, really our entire lives to be generous. Let me just define that word really quickly from the dictionary. Generosity is the willingness to give help or support, especially more than usual or more than expected. I'm sure you've had opportunities already in, these, uh, in this lockdown time especially to be generous. Maybe you knew a friend who was in need and you had the opportunity to give. Maybe you knew someone who was struggling and you were able to minister to them. I know that in our church we have so many generous people. Our life group leaders for one are constantly pouring out their life and giving. All our serve teams, from our worship team, our production team, uh, our prayer team. We used to have our welcome team at the door greeting you. And maybe when we go back to church, uh, they'll have to sanitize you, check your temperature. But people in our church are so generous. And I believe that this is today, this message is for all of us. Maybe you have been generous in the past and in this lockdown you've been struggling. You've been like, God, if I give more or if I serve more or if I give more of my time, um, I don't have the resources, how will I do it? But I believe that God is shaking us all up because it says here to give more than usual and more than is expected. Amen. Let me just uh, read scripture real quick from 2 Corinthians 9 and pastor was talking about it last week as well. 6 to 11 and a few verses here it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously, remember generous means more than usual, more than expected, will also reap generously. Amen. God loves a cheerful giver. And we're not talking about the old covenant way of giving where it was a tax, it was legalistic, where you had to give. But we're talking about our hearts today. And I believe that God is ministering to our hearts. Pastor Victor always says that all preaching is directed towards repentance. And repentance is such a great word because all it means is a change of our thinking, a change of our hearts. So I believe and I pray today that God is going to minister to all of our hearts and we're going to see a change as we step into being a generous church. Amen? Amen. Can you say amen at your homes? Leave a comment down below. I'm so excited. Let's get into the word. So the first point I have is that we are created to be generous. Because some of you are thinking that I think I'm created to be stingy or you have been so proud of the fact that you are in Hindi they say kanjus makhi chus. And you know, some, it's good to be prudent, it's good to be careful. I know I'm very careful with my finances. On my phone, I have an app which uh, to the paisa, it records every single rupee that I spend. But today I want to teach you from God's word and I'm sure you know this that in the truest sense, when God created us in his own image, he created us to be generous. We look at all throughout scripture from creation to the life of Jesus. God is generous. And when we are created in his image, we are created to be generous. Pastors preaching about our identity and our identity in Christ. Our DNA, our spiritual DNA when we are born again is that we are generous. If you look in the night and you see the stars, you look at the galaxies, you look at the sky, you look at the trees around you, the water bodies. God has been so generous and so lavish in creation. We look at the life of Jesus and the grace that we have received, the forgiveness of our sins, the love that Jesus poured out has been gracious. Amen. It has been generous. It has been, uh, it has been above and beyond what we could ask or imagine. And um, right from creation, when we look at in the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve really had no needs. God had given Adam a job, he gave him a place to stay, he gave him food. How many of you would sign up for that today? If I told you that I'd give you a place where you'd have a job, you'd have all your needs met, it sounds great, right? So imagine Adam in the garden, all the trees, all the fruit, all the vegetables that he could eat from. My wife makes a really good salad and she adds, generously adds almonds to it and cheese and all the fruits that we like, all the vegetables that we like, lots of leaves. I imagine that to be Adam's life. I'm sure that Adam did not have a concept of scarcity. 
He knew that there was an abundance. God was generous and everything that was there was good. Amen. And God told him, don't eat of this one tree. And in that moment when Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent, they gave in. And uh, let me tell you, church, that when God is generous and we understand generosity, one of the enemies of generosity is really selfishness. And right through scripture, we see whenever we are selfish and we say no to the plans of God and say yes to what we want, that's what Eve did. And uh, she looked at that tree that God told them, don't eat of this tree, this one tree right next to the tree of life was this one tree of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she chose to eat of it, even though God was so generous in giving them everything that they needed. She ate from it and the fall happened. And since then, if you look at all our lives, we know that we have a selfish tendency, right? And that's why scripture talks about in Romans 12 that we need to renew our mind because there is a pattern of this world and I'm sure you've seen it, which is a selfish pattern. We've had a few babies born recently in the lockdown. We did a couple of uh, dedications as well. And as a baby grows, you know, a baby's born into a sinful world. And uh, very soon I've heard that they start to sin. And one of the first things that you'll hear a baby articulate clearly from their mouth is mine. Even when they, you sh give them your finger, they'll grab it and they, say, they start talking, they say mine. And any of their toys, it's mine. And they don't want to share with anyone. And I'm sure parents, you've had a great opportunity, uh, which has not seemed so great in the time, to teach your kids about generosity because you'll have two of your kids fighting and often the older sibling is told that it's okay, let him have your toy and we teach generosity because even though we were created to be generous because God is generous and we are created in his image, the fall and sin has actually changed our view and made us very selfish. Even scripture tells us about the enemy, the devil, he comes to steal, kill and destroy. And really selfishness is the opposite of generosity. Let's look at uh, a passage of scripture in a story from John chapter 12. And we see how uh, Jesus had gone to visit his really good friends. We know Lazarus already from um, the passage where he was raised to life and he had been dead. He was in the tomb. And we know also uh, Jesus' interactions with Lazarus' two sisters, Mary and Martha. So let's pick up this story in John chapter 12 and I'll read verse 1 to 6. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. And we know why they were honoring Jesus is because Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Amen. So Martha served while Lazarus was among those who reclined at the table. Verse 3, I want you to pay close attention to this. Then Mary took a pint of, an, of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who, was la who later betrayed him, objected. Verse 5, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He didn't do this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. A as a keeper of the money bag, he often helped himself to what was put in it. Man, we see in this passage how Mary gave such a generous and a lavish offering. This was really coming from a heart of gratitude. Her only brother who was dead, who was in the tomb, was raised to life by Jesus. And she took this perfume, which even in today's terms would be, we could calculate the value of this as a year's wages. Think about it. I'm, I'm sure with the re you've probably paid your tax recently and you know how much money you earn in a year, right? That was the value of the generous gift that she gave. And it was really uh, her worship to Jesus and she wanted to anoint Jesus. So she poured out this perfume on Jesus' feet. But Judas, who was a thief, and we know later that he betrays Jesus um, for a bag of money, he objected. You know, he didn't care about the poor, but he was selfish. He knew that if that money was put in the offering bag, he would put his hands in it. The enemy of generosity is selfishness. 
And I believe that as we are born again and as we live for Jesus, our entire life now is not to live for ourselves, but to live in devotion to Jesus. It's our life is to be committed to submit to Jesus. And Jesus gives, gives us the best example when Jesus himself says that he did not come to serve, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for us. So we are created to be generous and we know that generosity pleases the heart of God. If you have seen any child, I'm sure when they've had a good father, all their life they just want to be like their father. They want to imitate their father. And it's a father's joy to see their son uh, imitate them, grow in their ways and behave like them, act like them. And I believe that even as scripture says that without faith it's impossible to please God. Because faith pleases the heart of God. When we step out in generosity, when we step out in giving of our money, of our resources, of our time, sometimes in Gurgaon, time is more precious than money. When we give of ourselves, we are really stepping out in faith to say, God, I believe that you will provide for me. God, I believe that you will take care of all my needs. And when I am generous, I am operating in faith. And faith pleases the heart of God. I want to share a story from my own life and this is from the year 2016 when I had the opportunity to go to Bethel School of Worship in Bethel Church in Redding, California. And we've all heard their music and we love what's happening in that church. So many miracles, signs and wonders. But God created this opportunity for me and um, just to backtrack a little bit, a few years ago I was at a prophetic conference in Mumbai and an uh, anointed prophet of God, he spoke over my life and he said that God is opening up, specifically he said, opening up an opportunity for you to go to America and to travel and to be trained in worship ministry. And at that time, I had received an invitation to go to another church uh, for, a, uh, for a conference and that church was going to pay for all the expenses. It was going to be a short trip, but I was really looking forward to it. So I felt that in my heart, that was a confirmation. I was like, yes, Lord, the prophet has spoken. This is going to happen. And at the, towards the end of the year, that conference was coming closer, but I didn't hear from them again. I reached out to them and found out they said that, you know, we don't have a budget for it. We're really sorry, but we won't be able to sponsor you to come. At that time, I was pretty disappointed, but I stood by the word of God. I knew that if God had spoken, then he would make a way. The next year in Feb, my mom receives an email from Bethel saying that we're having this school of worship. It's in America. It costs 900 US dollars. You have to pay for all your expenses. Uh, we'd like for you to sign up. She shared this with me and I immediately felt that I should take a step of faith. You know, let me pause my story here to just use this as a teaching point. Many of us, we feel that faith is this big thing that we need to do. But in reality, we learn through scripture that faith is just taking one step at a time. So my one step at a time was I didn't even have a visa. I didn't, my passport had expired. So I began the process of applying to the Bethel School of Worship. And I applied, I got in, I applied for my passport, I applied for my visa. And every step of the way, I didn't have the money for it. I was uh, just recently quit my job and I had started interning in the church. So I believed that God, if you want me to go, you are going to provide. And as I took every step of the way through family, through friends, through generous people in our church, God provided for me to go there. And I believe that uh, even getting a visa would have been a miracle and God opened doors. So as I went there and now I'm at Bethel School in July and the weather is beautiful in sunny California and I'm having the best experience of my life. I had a limited amount of resources. I had money with me that I knew had to last for the entire duration that I was in America. And I felt strongly in my heart that at different times, God was telling me that as you go to America, and you know, America has been in many parts of um, Western nations, Australia and England have poured in so many resources to India in the past. And often as Indians, we tend to look to abroad and we look to um, foreigners to provide for needs. It could be charitable, it could be for ministry. But I believe that God was saying to me that you are going to be a blessing where you go. So I just said yes to him and uh, without getting into too many stories, God gave me so many opportunities where he would speak to my heart clearly and say, this person, I want you to give them $100. And this was at a restaurant, uh, just to a waiter. And then the next day we were in a time of worship, just the students, there were about 30 of us. And one of my friends uh, said, you know, I just feel God saying that there's someone here who has a great financial need. 
and he felt awkward to say it because that's such a personal thing but he just spoke it in faith and after we finished this worship session where we had people from over 10 countries different nationalities worshiping Jesus together one of the ladies came and said how she had recently been in a really bad situation and she stepped out in faith and said that uh, she was the person who had lost all her money and someone sponsored her to come to Bethel immediately got put in my heart so $200 into her life and I took that step of faith and I gave. I didn't know where the rest of my expenses were, were going to come from, but I did it anyway. Moving uh, a few weeks later, after I finished my schooling at Bethel for the worship school, I was on my way back to uh, California, to, um, to San Francisco, to fly out to visit my sister. And one of the friends who I was with, who was actually giving me a lift back, he said, hey, my pastor just called and said, would you like to preach in church? And it was a Spanish church, so they would be, uh, it, they had a lot of Hispanic people from South America, Central America, and it would be translated. And uh, I had only preached a few times in my life. I would have rather led worship, but I said yes. And as I was sitting and preparing, God gave me a word. I shared it with them. I had a great time. So much of their culture was similar to ours. And I know we have some Brazilians in our church, and uh, it's so awesome to be a multi generational, multicultural church. Anyway, I preached there and uh, at the end, um, they came and gave me an uh, envelope with the offering for that evening. And I was so overwhelmed because everything was happening in Spanish. So I didn't even know that they were collecting an offering for me, but the pastor had announced it. I went back home that night after dinner and I looked in and it had $357. Remember, I had given when God led me to give $300 and I received $357. And when God gives you so generously and you know that your faith has moved the heart of God, I knew the next thing I had to do was give it away again. So before I left uh, for Chicago, I gave my friend some money and I left. And as I went there again in Chicago, God gave me opportunities to sow and give. And while I was in Chicago, someone called me and said, hey, is there a Western Union near you? I didn't even know what Western Union was. I was so naive. So I said, yeah, sure. I thought they were sending me maybe a postcard. I went to Western Union, $300 right into my name. I had so much money that God had given me and I was able to then give $500 to someone who had a need for a laptop. I say all this not to boast about myself, but I know that when you have an opportunity to give, it pleases your heart, but it pleases the heart of God. And my next point is that when you give generously, when you give of your life, it really opens doors for the miraculous. Generosity opens doors for the miraculous. So we're going to look at one of my favorite passages of scripture. I'm sure you've all heard this story. It is from John chapter 6 of Jesus feeding the 5,000. So let's read John chapter 6 verse 1 to 13. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed over to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Let me stop here to say that Jesus knew that many people who came and they listened to his teachings and they followed him all around, the crowds that came, they came because they wanted to see miracles. Yeah, they were selfish. They wanted to, they were there for what they can get. But that didn't stop Jesus. Verse 3, Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Verse 5, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Verse 6, He, was, he asked them only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. You know, we can see here that many times, when a need arises, that need, not that God causes problems, God didn't cause hunger in these people, God has not caused the coronavirus pandemic, but when a need arises like this, God will use that as a teaching moment or as a test for us. And it's so different when we receive tests from maybe our boss gives us a task that he knows we can't achieve because he wants us to fail. Or maybe you've been for a math exam and you're not prepared and you know you're going to fail. But when God gives us a test, it's really an opportunity for promotion. 
God is not wanting you to fail. In fact, He has given you His Holy Spirit. He is walking with you. He is encouraging you. He is giving you a great cloud of witnesses, which is the church and people around you. So when a test comes from God, it really reveals our heart to see what do we believe about God. Today, if you believe that God is good, if you believe that God loves you, every test that comes from Him is a test for promotion. And this was an opportunity that the disciples had to really show Jesus that Jesus, we have been following you, we've been your disciples, and we have faith. And this is what the disciples replied. Philip answered him, verse 7, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to even have a bite. That sounds pretty sarcastic, right? Philip, I wish you could just be honest and say, Jesus, we don't have the money, but that's what he chose to say. He didn't believe that they could even provide a bite. Verse 8, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Verse 9, here's a boy with five loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Just think of that boy for a second. He could have hid in a corner. I would have probably done that and eaten the lunch that his mom had prepared for him. But this boy was generous. When the disciples came looking for food, he said, I have and I gave. And he could have kept maybe some of it because he didn't trust what these disciples would do. Would he get even enough? There were so many people. There were more than 5,000. There were just 5,000 men. Then there were women and children. But he was generous. Today, I want to ask you, church, what is in your hand? Maybe you're saying, I have no job right now. I have no finances. It doesn't matter. At our church, we believe that in the new covenant, God is not asking you for 10% of your money, but he's asking you for your entire life. Romans 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. And that is our worship. The pastor was encouraging us that giving of our finances, that is worship to God. We don't do it like in the old covenant out of compulsion. Or we don't do it to get favor from God. We don't do it to receive his love and blessing. But the reason we give and I believe the reason that this boy gave is because he knew that it was when he gave and he gave of what he had, Jesus would multiply it. Amen. Jesus could do more with what he had than he could do for himself. And today I believe that there is a test. We are all in a testing period. In this year of breakthrough, we are seeing such scarcity. We are seeing our economy struggling. But this is an opportunity for us as a church. God is saying, if you want to step into breakthrough, if you want to step into the miraculous, if you want to see signs and wonders happen, the key is generosity. Amen. So let's look at what happens next. Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated and gave them as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. I want us to look at Jesus' attitude when he received these five loaves and two fish. Jesus knew that in the natural, this was not going to be enough to feed all of them. But the first thing that Jesus does after he sits everyone down is he gives thanks. This is such a learning for us, church, that even in a time when you don't have or you are praying for a miracle. Maybe you're praying for a baby and you've been, as a couple, you have been praying and seeking God and asking God for a child. Maybe you're praying for that new job. We just had a marriage preparation course and so many of our wonderful singles, we had 16 people sign up for it. Maybe you're praying for a spouse. God is teaching us today through the life of Jesus that even before he saw the miracle, he held what was in his hand and he gave thanks. You know, when we praise God in advance, even before we have received the miracle, something begins to happen in our heart. Amen. We start to operate in faith. And Jesus said he gave thanks. And he gave thanks to God. I'm sure his attitude was knowing that God was going to multiply. Amen. So God is interested in our hearts today. And if you're going through any tough situation, I want you to begin by giving thanks to God. Give thanks to him because it will change what is inside of you. You'll begin to focus more on God, less on the situation, less on the problem, less on what's happening outside. And God will begin to change what's happening in your heart. And you will begin to see that when what's inside changes, then what's on the outside will begin to change. Amen. 
So we see here that Jesus prays and the next thing he does and different translations they translated to say that he gave it to his disciples to then distribute. You know, Jesus could have prayed and miraculously all the food in a buffet style in a beautiful table would have appeared. But Jesus chose to feed the 5,000 through his disciples. The reason that we are believing that God is calling us to be a generous church is not just so that we can be rich and we can buy big buildings and have fancy cars, but God wants you to be a blessing for others. Amen. So when we start to look at our money and see that God is blessing me so that I can be a blessing, it changes our perspective about resources. Money then doesn't become a difficult subject to talk about. You know, many people say that Jesus was poor and yes, he became poor so that we could be rich. But for the creator God who could speak and things would happen, he spoke creation into existence. He prayed and five loaves and two fish could feed feed 5,000 people. When he needed money for tax, they just went fishing and a fish had gold coins in the mouth. For a God who can create, nothing is impossible. Amen. And today I want to speak to us, um, especially in the year of breakthrough. I know that many of us are struggling financially and maybe you have a lot of financial debt and the interest is, is amounting and increasing and it's putting a lot of strain on your family, on your personal life. God wants to deliver you from this, amen? God wants to set you free from this bondage of debt. And one of the keys to it is if you can be generous. And it doesn't matter how much you have or how much you can give, but what matters is your heart. Today I challenge you, just like that woman who gave two copper coins in the temple. There were many rich people who came and gave abundance of wealth, but Jesus' heart went towards and his eyes went towards that woman. Because she gave, even though she didn't have, she poured it out. She gave it to God. Amen, church. I believe that you've been encouraged this morning that God is generous and we carry his DNA. As his children, he has created us to be generous. You know, we are not wired for being selfish, but our original design, when we become new creations, we go back to that place of being the way our father is, that is generous. We know that generosity pleases the heart of God. And when we step out in faith, just like that little boy gave the five loaves and two fish into the hands of Jesus, when we step out in generous, outlandish giving, and when we are faithful and we give to the Lord, He can move mountains and He can do miracles. Amen. So this morning, I want to encourage you as we close that when I'm generous, I will never lack. Amen. When I'm generous, I will walk in abundance. When I'm generous, I will see miracles, signs and wonders take place. And when I'm generous, I will reap a harvest. Let me read for you Galatians 6 verse 9. It says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You know, we're in the ninth month of the year and even the news says that there's this uh, lockdown fatigue. People are getting tired, even though cases are going up, they're still going out and taking more risks because people are just tired. They've become weary in doing good. They've become weary in wearing their masks. They've become weary in taking care of their health. But in our area of giving, in sacrificial giving, in giving of our lives, in submission to God's word, in submission to Jesus and what he says, let us not become weary. So I want to encourage you in your giving, uh, maybe you've been giving faithfully this whole year or maybe not, in your attending of life group, in your serving people, in your ministering to people, in, even in your sharing of the gospel and sharing your testimony, you may have been faithful and now you're just getting weary. I encourage you, do not give up. Your breakthrough is right around the corner. And I believe that God is making us a generous church, an influential church, so that we can be channels of blessing. We can be a breakthrough for others. So let me pray for us as we close this morning. It's been a great time of ministry together and worship together. Thank you, church, for being generous with your time and being part of this service. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for each one on this call, Lord. Thank you that you have created us and wired us for generosity. And when we step out in faith and we give you what we have, Lord, with a heart of submission, because we love you and we give to you, you do miracles with it. So we're believing, Lord, for many miracles, even in our church. We know that there are needs 
that are represented, Lord, on this service and on this um, platform. I pray for all those who need jobs, Lord. I believe, Lord, that in this year of breakthrough, you open doors and provide the best job for them. I believe, Lord, for all those who are struggling with financial debt. And I prophesy over you today that as you are generous with your life, as you are plugged into the local church, as you are committed to God and you, as you step out in faith, Lord, we are believing that there will be a cancellation of every debt in the name of Jesus. He who the Son sets free has been free indeed. So we bless you, Lord, and we thank you that you are so generous with us. We thank you that we can walk in the same spirit, in the same anointing, Lord. We pray a blessing over our church for all those who are watching today, especially, Lord, for those who are praying and believing for family members to come to know you as they give of their prayer life as they intercede on behalf of family, Lord. We believe that you will encounter all our loved ones, that each one would come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord. We honor you, we love you, and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen, church. Wow, what a powerful message on generosity by Pastor Daniel. I want to thank you once again for joining in on our online service. And I hope that you were encouraged by this message. And I just want to share one thing with you. Our God is a generous God. And we lack nothing being His sons and daughters. So as you give today to God out of your generosity, just keep in mind that you will never lack anything. We want to encourage you to give on our online platforms. You will see a QR code on the screen. And you will see some details that we'll send out to you. And there are multiple ways that you can give. You can get in touch with us and bless the Lord as offering is your worship. And another way to worship is with our family. Church is our family and we still meet during the time of lockdown. We meet in these groups called live groups and we meet over Zoom calls. And let me tell you, it's an amazing experience seeing everybody, even through this time of pandemic when we are all locked down in quarantine, but we have this privilege of meeting on Zoom calls and pray for each other. So I would encourage you to be a part of a life group. And if you've not already signed up, get in touch with us. Leave a comment down below and we will get you connected to one of the life groups that will bless you abundantly. I also want to encourage you to send your kids for our kids life program, which happens on Saturdays. And I truly believe that your kids will grow up to be really strong in God and in the Word of God. And it will really help them to grow and bless people around them. We also have a teens program where you can send your teens and they will learn a lot through this age when they are seeing changes in their lives. But the Word of God helps them tackle all of those changes and be on track where God wants them to be. So why don't you sign up for your kids or your teens you go on our website, you use the links provided over there, you will see all the details you can sign up. Alright church, now's the time that we meet on Zoom for our after church hangout where you can get prayers done for yourself or just even catch up with the family. I hope you remember the time when we used to meet outside the church. You can still meet on Zoom call and it's fun. Well, thank you so much once again for joining. God bless you. See you next week.